heart and the heart of love. Please be seated. That they may all be one. A high ambition, uh, considering that we in the church can hardly find total consensus around things like whether God's table is open to all or only those who are baptized, something that's going to be debated at this year's general convention, or even being able to agree on answering the question of who are God's people. That they may all be one. Certainly Jesus knew what to pray for just as we did this activity remembering what the significance of prayer is, why we pray, what we can pray for. Certainly we can look to Jesus as a guide here. Uh, Now, for those who don't know me yet, uh, I'm Tom Dutton. I'm the priest in charge up at Faith in Highland Park. I am married to your cousin Julie Ficker, amazing, Uh, very happily married right in this spot uh, almost 14 weeks ago. Uh, Couldn't be happier. And we are having a reception tonight at 6. You are, of course, invited to celebrate with us. And as we've been thinking about our relationship, uh, as we were getting ready for the wedding, and now, uh, you know, as we went through our honeymoon and as we get ready to celebrate tonight, uh, I was thinking about kind of those early days with her. And how, you know, it's kind of unusual for two priests to (laughs) connect. Um, So it it made for some interesting new discussion uh, that you probably don't get in most households, uh, such as early on in our relationship, bonding over uh, shared sermon prep and connecting over which podcasts we like to listen to and blogs that we like to read as we are collecting our thoughts. And we still do that. We still kind of check in on Saturday night or Sunday morning, what what are you going to preach about today? I don't know, I'm kind of stuck. And you know, this week is no different. We have this impossibility of trying to reflect meaningfully on something that was so senseless, on the children who died in Uvalde. And the week before that, there was the shooting in Buffalo, and we can go back and back and back. And it seems like there's always something going on in the world troubling the waters. Something that has led Megan and I to start wondering as we are uh, starting a family together, if this is what the world is like, why do people bring children into it? And I think I think that as much hopelessness as that question can convey, I think that the answer is hope. I think that this world is still worth living in, worth partnering with people in, because there is still hope. There is beauty, truth, and love to share with one another. This is the same world that led Jesus through a farce of a trial only to torture and to kill him. It's the same world that, as we'll hear in another service today, if you follow the lectionary, it's the same world that imprisoned Paul and Silas for impacting the slaveholders' financial security because Paul and Silas held hope and love for the one they began to liberate. This is a world where beauty, truth, and love exist and can be shared, and I believe that there is hope. When I worked at a high school a few years ago, uh, I loved my students. I absolutely, every day was the best day to get to go to work and work with these amazing kids, to get to share the world uh, through their eyes again. And it's been a little bit since I was in high school myself. And I began to realize just how large that gap was when I started working with these students and seeing the world kind of newly through their eyes, remembering how I had seen it when I was their age, seeing the things that had changed, seeing what matters to them. And and that reminded me of what my journey has been like and how it's led me. One of the students that I love to work with there, uh, he had this cat. 
he was really into bicycles. And so he had this hat from a bicycle shop in town. And he wore this hat every day. Every day. It was like part of his identity. Now, if you haven't been inside the doors of a high school in a while, uh, much like adult life, you forget things sometimes. Uh, but when you're in high school, you can't just leave to go home and grab whatever you forgot or pop over to the corner store. You're there. <laughs> you have a job to do of learning. So I remember the office there had this table where parents could come and drop things off. If their kid forgot their lunch or dropped a book or their homework in the car and they found it, they could come back and leave it at this pickup table in the office so that their kid could come and get what they needed to get through the rest of the day. And one day, I remember I was in second period, and we went into lockdown because there was a threat of a firearm on campus. And I'll never forget my teaching partner and I and how hard she worked uh, as the person who read the instructions from the office to calmly communicate the instructions and try to keep us all safe, uh, not knowing the whole story of what was going on. And at the time, I didn't know if this was just an abundance of caution or if something awful was about to happen to my kids. I don't know if I would be able to keep them safe. Ultimately, the event was resolved. No one was injured. And we give thanks for that. And then we all went through the motions of getting through the rest of the day as scheduled. And in fourth period, I found out that Hat Kid's hat had been stolen, as if we needed more things to happen that day. And you have to understand, this was like part of his identity. It was a source of security. And losing it was like losing a part of himself. So after holding myself together all day, you know, trying to be the strong one <laughs> to get the kids through the day, I remember getting home, and I was just shaking when I could finally let it go. But I kept thinking about this kid. So I knew the bicycle shop. I knew you know, where it was. And so my mom and I went, because <laughs> I couldn't drive. <laughs> So my mom and I went to the bicycle shop, and I bought a hat. And the next day, I sent this kid to the office, where he found a paper bag with his name on it and a familiar article of clothing inside. Being able to take some small action, no matter how insignificant, is part of the healing process. Action is part of the work of healing. The practice of lament contains not only an expression of grief, but also hope. See, lament isn't despair. Lament isn't hopelessness. Lament is the bridge from our grief and our trouble to our hope. And that's what can lead us toward healing. And I think that this is what Jesus was getting at when he prayed for his disciples, knowing the difficult days that they were about to go through. He prayed that they might overcome those difficult days by sharing together in unity and love. And then after he ascended and left them on their own, it was now up to them, to the apostles, to carry on his teachings meeting the difficult days ahead with love and hope. So as we walk through this world, wondering where our source of hope is, may we look to Jesus, may we look to the example of the apostles, and may we press on as they did, proclaiming with and without words, by thoughts as well as actions, that same love and hope that Jesus gifted to us. And may we all be one.